So, hi, I'm Julian Borbach, uh, Associate Professor at UH. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys uh, about this book that I wrote that was published in 2019. So I did do uh, a book tour or a kind of a rolling book tour that went on for a while, kind of like a one man rock band for a year or so until uh, COVID shut it all down. So it's been a little while, it's been about a year, I guess, since I gave one of these talks. So if I'm a little rusty, please uh, forgive me. I'll probably pick up speed as I go along. Um, but uh, as Karina and Alfie were, um, were uh, I guess, were able to say or conscientious enough to point out, uh, I, this is a biography of uh, a guy named Ben Hecht. Uh, maybe during the Q&A, uh, I can talk a little bit about why I ended up deciding to do a biography of this guy. There were just certain things about my own personal past that raised questions about who I was and where I came from. And this was suggested to me by uh, actually an Israeli professor um, that I just had a conversation with at, at some point back in 2007. And he said, you may wanna look at this guy because I think you're gonna find a lot of connections with him. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time, Ben Hecht had a, had a really busy life um, and Really, I guess from beginning to end, it, it I spent several years of year research and then a full year just writing the book. It's it's about four to five hundred pages long, um, and um, Hecht is really kind of significant for two reasons. Um, one is he he was he's really well remembered um, for his writing for Hollywood. Um, and also because he, he played a role in history um, with the Holocaust. Um, so he's sort of a unique among American writers in that way, and that he both was important in terms of American literature and particularly in terms of Jewish American literature of the 20th century, but also at the same time, he's this, this figure that, uh, that had an important role to play um, with, with the really significant global events of World War II and the Holocaust. Um, and so this was kind of turned out to be a really big subject for me to take on. And I ended up finding that I was really wrestling with one big question, which is in looking at everything that Peck did, how he developed and then what he came out and sort of uh, took a very public position about uh, what, what can we learn? What insights did he have about the world um, that, that still matter today? Because um, as, as historians, we're always looking at how is the past relevant to the present and relevant to the future? Um, so as I was saying, he's, he's really important in one way as um, kind of a Hollywood legend. They call him the Shakespeare of Hollywood. Um, Hecht really came to Hollywood right with the birth of sound uh, when there was a really important migration of writers, um, especially journalists from the East Coast out to Hollywood because suddenly with uh, movies suddenly being able to talk, you needed people to be able to write the scripts and journalists could write fast. Um, they knew what the public wanted. Um, and so Hollywood started really aggressively recruiting them um, there's a legendary telegram that Hecht received from uh, Herman Mankiewicz, who was the author of, uh, of course, the legendary film Citizen Kane and a good buddy of Hecht's. Um, and the telegram basically said, will you accept $600 a week to write for uh, Paramount? Um, you know, the, the money is crazy, basically, and, and the only competition out here is idiots. Don't let word get around. Uh, now, you know, going through the archives, I never could actually find that telegram, although Hecht saved a tremendous amount of his stuff, and these guys were given to a good tale. So who knows if that telegram ever existed verbatim. I mean, he's pretty honest in his autobiographical stuff, but he's also a tale teller, so we'll never really know. But um, a lot of the stories anyway uh, tell us a lot about the times and who they are. And when he said, uh, you know, that the money is basically ridiculous and, and uh, 
the only competition that that's not verbatim, but the only competition is idiots is verbatim and uh, don't let this get around. That really comes, um, you know, that, that really speaks to uh, Hollywood at the time. Um, they all kind of came out in a group and Hecht was probably among all of them, um, a lot of famous people that you guys have heard of people like great writers like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and William Faulkner to journalists like Dorothy Parker or Mankiewicz himself. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they were great at Gap. They, they had a, uh, were kind of had a lot of fun together. They were pretty decadent, had a lot of fun drinking together. And um, they, and of all of them, Hecht was really probably the most successful at being able to regularly churn out movies that were a hit and he could turn them out fast. Uh, one of the lines that I have early in my um, biography is that, you know, Hecht was spinning out these, these blockbusters for Hollywood with a speed and resourcefulness that at times resembled a kind of sorcery. Um, he could write in just about any genre because this was the golden age of Hollywood and the birth of sound, this was a moment when you could actually invent genres. And so Hecht uh, introduced the gangster picture uh, and which quickly became the gangster movie craze. So he wrote the 1932 version of Scarface. Many of you probably know the film from the remake with Al Pacino in the early eighties set in Miami. Um, but uh, there was an original, you know, uh, gangster movie to end all gangster movies called Scarface. He wrote um, the final draft of Gone with the Wind. Um, one of his best films was um, Hitchcock's Notorious. Um, and so altogether he wrote, uh, he, he played a hand in, you know, kind of an amazing number of like uh, 100 and more than 140 films. Um, and uh, a lot of times he was he was called in as a script doctor, as was the case with um, uh, Gone with the Wind, where uh, they were the studios were in big trouble and they were willing to spend maximum bu bucks to somebody who could come in and within a few days of sleepless work uh, produce for them a successful movie. And that's what happened with Gone with the Wind. They were just stuck with it. Um, to give you a broader picture, heck. Uh, published over 30 books in his life, uh, a number of novels, uh, a series of memoirs. Um, he started as a crime reporter, which I'll get into. Um, he ended up moving to New York City during the, the, the jazz age of the 1920s um, when the literary scene was really hot there. Um, and uh, he wrote, one of the most famous things he wrote was The Front Page, uh, which is a uh, newspaper comedy, which has been remade, I think four times or five times um, as movies and has gone through uh, regular um, uh, uh, reintroductions on Broadway. Um, it's one of the great classics of the American stage, probably one of the greatest American comedies written for the stage. Um, and so he, he had that hit in, on Broadway before um, Hollywood snatched him up. Um, right around 1927 when movies went to film. Um, so he, he was not just versatile in terms of writing different genres for Hollywood, but in writing novels, uh, writing journalism, writing opinion columns, uh, writing dramatic plays, writing for television. Um, he could write it for just about every media at the time. Um, so he did that. And at the same time, um, he ended up in a kind of insurrectionist role within Hollywood itself. Um, this was a time during the 1930s when um, the studios really ended up being kind of cowed by the Nazis and, and by Hitler to the point where there was a uh, Nazi consul in uh, Hollywood who would literally go over all the scripts that Hollywood was producing and um, basically put a, put a stop to anything that had any even a whiff of anti-Nazism, let alone anything that would suggest anything about the German persecution of the Jews. So Hollywood was essentially muzzled um, during the 1930s. Um, and Hecht um, started to kind of, you know, he was alarmed as many people were by what was happening uh, in, in Central Europe with the rise of Hitler. And he started to chafe 
um, under the system quite a bit. Um, and what he says is that with everything that was happening on the world stage, he had always been kind of an un, what he called an un-Jewish Jew. There was a term that int was introduced later um, in scholarship about Jewish American culture called a non-Jewish Jew. What he says before that was really discussed by scholars or in discussions about Jewish American culture was he uses the phrase un-Jewish Jew. And, and what he meant by that was he wasn't particularly observant. It wasn't a very visible or obvious part of his uh, public identity. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily uh, central for a long time, although he's always close with his family, it wasn't necessarily central to how he saw himself and how he understood himself. And so what he says in his memoir was, I turned into a Jew in 1939, the Nazi persecution of the Jews brought my Judaism to the surface. Um, and for reasons that I'm gonna talk to you all about today, Hecht had a unique um, perspective on the world. And as a result, with the rise of Nazism, um, a lot of people who look back at the Holocaust and talk about the late 30s and early 40s, um, talk about a, a phrase that Deborah Lipstadt, who's a Holocaust historian and, and uh, also a media scholar uh, used was beyond belief um, to describe the way that the, the coming of the death camps the train system, the crematoria, all of that was something that, that people weren't prepared to imagine in by the late 30s or even by 40 or as late as 41 or 42. Um, and Hecht wrote an extraordinary short story in, in, uh, that was published in June of 1939. So he probably wrote it right around the time in the fall of 38 when Kristallnacht happened, which was the the terrible Jewish pogrom um, in Germany where so many shops were smashed and so many Jews were killed on the streets. Um, Hecht at the time wrote a short story called um, The Little Candle, which in really vivid, horrifying detail describes the Holocaust at a time when this was unimaginable to the world. Um, and so you can go back and you can look at book reviews from 1932 of Heck's book, and they talk about the little candle, the short story, and they say he actually imagines uh, this extermination of the Jews in Europe, like it's this insane vision. But when you read it um, now, it looks like a, an account of the Holocaust. It's really vivid, it's really scary. And so he had this kind of second sight and, and one of the questions, you know, going back to my original question that I had in writing the whole book was why? Why did he see things differently? How did he see what was coming at a time when others didn't? Um, and so as a result, when, you know, to, to be specific about the important role he played in history, when news reports started to come out of what's called the final solution to the Jewish question, which a lot of times, looking back, we conflate with like the Holocaust and they're two very different terms or show off, right? Um, when, when news actually began to come out about the final solution to the Jewish question, and this was basically the, the, the Nazi plan to exterminate all Jews, the genocidal plan that the Nazis eventually embraced that involved the trains, the crematoria, you know, the gas chambers, uh, the crematoria. By the time this all happened, um, it it got onto page six of like the Washington Post. Um, there was so much going on in the news. The Guadalcanal was happening within a couple months. There was the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, we were this was the fall of 1942. So we were uh, the United States um, was really just becoming deeply involved in, in the battles um, that would be decisive in the war. And we can talk about different reasons why this news was buried. But when Hecht and the small group of people that he was involved with, who at the time were trying to raise awareness and you know, raise funding and support for a Jewish army, because you know, of course they were aware of the persecution of the Jews, but not a Nazi plan to exterminate them. When they became aware of the final solution to the Jewish question, they understood 
that this was an emergency. And as the slide says, the idea of a, of a race against death. They realized they had limited amount of time that something like 2 million Jews had already been murdered um, or two to 4 million had already been murdered within a year to two years, it would be, you know, by 1945, it would be 6 million Jews. Um, and they had a kind of a clarity about that. And so Hecht, with all of his uh, talents as a writer and as a storyteller and all his abilities in all these different media that I've been describing from newspapers to, uh, to the stage, to film, uh, just he became a, a kind of a one man orchestra of trying to shake the American public and wake them up to the final solution to the Jewish question. So it's important to say, to be specific and accurate and, and say, you know, Heck kind of broke the silence in the American media. I would, it would be lazy to say about the Holocaust and that's where a lot of confusion comes in because that's a very broad term that, that can involve all persecution of the Jews. But he really was involved in breaking the silence in, an, in a really significant way about the news of the final solution of the Jewish question. And the reason he did this, the reason why it was so important was that they, there was an understanding that they needed to, with him and this, this handful of people that he was joined with, that they needed to um, move public opinion. They needed to wake up public American public awareness to put pro, uh, pressure on the Roosevelt administration for an allied plan to rescue the Jews. That if there wasn't a major allied effort, um, then there'd be no way to get the Jews out of this death trap of Europe that Hitler had created. Um, and so they had a, uh, as this slide sort of suggests, they had a, um, a whole variety, and, th and this is really a core group of, of Hecht with about five other activists who were 25 years old uh, Jewish activists that had just arrived off the boat from Palestine. Uh, a bunch of them in their first couple of years here in the early 40s had to learn English. Um, and these guys had really no money to their name. They reached out to Heck to join them. And then they got the news of the final solution. They found they were in this emergency and they launched almost immediately this massive um, full spectrum publicity campaign of, you know, and I give you some of the statistics here is 40 ads in uh, 200 newspapers, these massive um, show to end all shows, celebrity pageants at Madison Square Garden um, and at the, um, you know, at stadiums across the country, um, like the Hollywood Bowl in, in Los Angeles. Um, you know, Hecht was giving constant speeches and fundraisers. And then there was a really innovative, um, forward thinking um, political lobbying effort where they were reach really reaching out to Congress. Um, they were putting out ads, they were getting more and more influential. Uh, public intellectuals who are signing on and endorsing them and also going out on the road to kind of spread the word. Um, so one of the biggest events um, was We Will Never Die. Um, it was uh, the, the main speakers were the Hollywood movie stars that had starred in Hex gangster movies, Edward G. Robinson and Paul Muni, but it had a cast of, um, and, and this was kind of a thing at the time, but Hex really kind of brought it to another level um, of like, it had a cast of like 500 people on it. As you can see all the people on the stage, uh, 40,000 people in two different sets of audiences saw it in March of 1943 at Madison Square Garden. And then it went on tour. And it was to, again, wake the public up to the fact that there was this extermination underway and there was a race against death, a race against time to, to get an allied rescue program underway. Um, of course, that, that failed. We all know what happened. As much as, as talented as Hecht was and as energized as that was, they were able to move the, the needle. They were able to put the final solution on the front pages of the American papers. But the politics of the, of the war were such that they really couldn't get the allies to launch a rescue effort. Um, a lot of that had to do with the fact that, you know, America's chief ally was Britain, which occupied Palestine. If refugees were to come over anywhere en masse, it, it might have been across the Mediterranean and to, into the palace uh, and into Palestine. 
Uh, the British who were fighting the Nazis had a restive um, Native Arab population on their hands and were concerned about boatloads of refugees streaming across or, or with allied assistance coming across the Mediterranean and getting dumped into Palestine where that might set off riots and make the war effort more complicated for Britain. Um, and we had, as, a, as the United States, we had just been emerging from the Great Depression. Uh, there was a lot of um, nativism and um, you know, anti-immigration sentiment carrying over from the 1930s. So people were highly suspicious of the idea of, of bringing boatloads of refugees over to the United States. But whatever the reason, the Roosevelt administration really slow walked um, a rescue effort. The, one of the big arguments they put out was, um, well, the best way for us to save the Jews is to win the war. Um, this infuriated Hecht. Um, and in the aftermath of the war, you, you had a situation where you had hundreds of thousands of, of survivors of the Holocaust left in the concentration camps. Britain, by the end of the war, still occupied Palestine and still had a barrier up for immigration of refugees from the camps to get across. These people were called displaced persons. And so the experience of the war, the failure to be able to rescue the Jews had radicalized Hecht. And the group that he was with, which we, you know, we know of as the Irgun, um, basically uh, were behind an armed revolt against the British occupation. Um, and um, so Heck shifted from his appeal to humanism to um, continuing to do um, events like a, a play starring a, a unknown 19 year old at the time named Marlon Brando um, called um, A Flag is Born, uh, which played on Broadway. Um, and he would use the money to fund, uh, to buy weapons to ship to Palestine in the fight against the British. And then as the British began talking about withdrawal, um, that money went into um, the, the Arab-Israeli war on the side of the Jews um, to, you know, in, in that war. And um, it's important to, to understand the, 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 the Jewish politics in, in Palestine in the 1940s. Uh, there were two groups. The main group was the Haganah, which ended up becoming, uh, they were kind of under the, the leadership of um, David Ben-Gurion, um, who became the first prime minister of Israel. Um, their strategy was to appeal to the United Nations, uh, to the appeal to the United States and to Britain, um, most Im importantly, to ask for a partition plan and to find a political solution for a birth of a Jewish state. The Irgun was the more militant the, one, the group that Hecht was behind was the more militant and radical group. Um, and they directly set, you know, had an armed um, struggle against the British occupation. So they were, they were directly involved in, in you know, bombing the British, shooting British troops, um, and a, so a direct attack on America's biggest ally, which as you can imagine, was rather controversial in the United States. Um, so Hecht writes, a flag is born, there's Marlon Brando. It's a kind of a militant um, drama about, um, you know, the, the birth of Israel, um, the fight for a Jewish state. Um, and he uses that money um, to, to fund both, um, you know, the, the ad campaign and the fundraising efforts, but also to buy weapons and, a, and an arm ship. Um, for the Irgun. Um, and then he puts out this notorious ad in 1947 in, the, in May. It's a full page ad with the provocative title, Letters to the Terrorists of Palestine. Because by this time, the Irgun is being called uh, the Jewish terrorists or the Palestinian terrorists because of their uh, violent attacks against the British. Um, and one of the, the lines in um, Heck's advertisement is, is right here. This was the one that really set people off. You can imagine for an American audience, but also for a global audience, how this looked. He said, every time you blow up a British arsenal or send a British railroad train sky high or let go with your bombs, your guns and bombs at the British betrayers and invaders of your homeland, the Jews of America make a little holiday in their hearts. 
So he's seen as a real extremist. Some people um, like Edward G. Robinson, the Hollywood actor, never speak to him again. Um, he becomes this notorious figure at this point. And right at the same time, Hecht has a new partner in the effort for the fight to a Jewish state, which is, here's a guy who started, you know, Ben Hecht starts as a Chicago crime reporter. He becomes the author of uh, gangster screenplays for the, you know, he introduces the gangster movie to Hollywood. And by 1947, he's partnered with a, Jew, a real Jewish gangster and the mob, um, you know, across America to smuggle arms and material to Palestine in the fight for a Jewish state. And then this ends up, um, a lot of these arms end up getting used in the Arab-Israeli war um, against the Arab armies when they invade. Um, and so Mickey Cohen is kind of the king of the West Coast rackets. Um, and in some ways he, he kind of comes to uh, symbolize the tough Jew for Hecht. And um, one of the arguments I make in the book is how important the American mob turned out to be in terms of um, arming the Jews of, of Palestine um, during the, the fight for a Jewish state. Um, so you can see there's quite an evolution here for this guy. Starts as a journalist, is kind of a, uh, a bon vivant in um, New York and in Hollywood, um, writing novels and plays and screenplays. Um, becomes politicized, comes out with a massive humanitarian appeal, uh, sort of asking uh, the world to help rescue the Jews, and then, you know, fails at this, becomes further radicalized, um, or at least the radical that was always there, the rebel that was always there within Heck, is really what boils to the surface in his anger over uh, the genocide. And he becomes labeled a gangster and a terrorist, a fascist. So if you just look at that one window of transformation from his humanitarian appeals to his um, partnering with Mickey Cohen to ship weapons, um, we see a, a real, what seems like a, a really dramatic shift, right? From humanitarian activist to you know, militant. Um, and so there's that question of, is that really a change you know, how, how do we also explain how Hecht on one hand was, you know, the, the non-Jewish Jew and then suddenly finds himself the ultimate Jew. Um, and what I found was a lot at the root of the questions that, that you find, and, and you have to go to Hecht's many books and, and movies to see the conversation that he's really kind of having with himself and with his audiences that is really a through line through every story that he tells. What he's basically doing in all of this remarkably prolific body of work is he's spinning out variations of what he sees as really the most important question of the time. And I would argue the question that he leaves us with um, that is just so important to our politics um, and our media today. And the way that Hecht put it, and he said he got this line from Joseph Conrad, which is uh, the soul, a question of the soul of man. And just a fundamental question that has so many philosophical and political and legal implications and implications in terms of the function and nature of our media, which is, is man fundamentally good or, or, or not, or evil? Um, and, um, or, you know, is, is, if we look at human nature a different way, how, how do we understand the rise of Nazism, um, the, the health of our democracy then, the health of our democracy today, uh, the role that our media plays in all that. So a lot of implications. So to break that down and to just kind of uh, quickly, and I'm gonna try and do this in about 10 minutes to leave time with, for a QA, and a um, I'm just gonna hit three of these four major themes. The, the media theme, I think I'll leave alone because I think people might have a lot of questions you know, I, I looked at one of the things I looked at was the media and corruption because there was just so much um, spillover between uh, the media of Hex Time, the newspapers, and other things, and, and actual criminal activity that that's a subject in itself. But I think a lot of people might be 
really interested in Hecht as a propagandist and questions about misinformation and disinformation. And that's a little bit of a different subject. So I'm gonna hit these first three and then maybe we can talk about whatever media implications people wanna bring up. Um, so to begin with the first one, you have to understand Hecht as a, someone who started as a crime reporter. And that's how he developed his view of, um, of the way government operates, the nature of government, um, and its relationship with, with crime itself. So when Hecht was a young crime reporter, like at a time when uh, most of the rest of us maybe go on to college, get our first jobs, whatever, and sort of come of age at 17 years old, 18 years old, that's when Hecht started as a newspaper reporter. He started as what was called a picture stealer. So this was a time when it was very hard for newspapers to acquire photographs because cameras weren't portable. And so they used to send um, these boys out to go uh, climb into, like break into, into houses and other buildings often and steal photos that they would then print in the, in the, in the newspaper. And so Hecht, um, which is a real thing. I mean, you read it in Hecht's memoirs and you think, come on, he's gotta be making this up. And then you find out, oh no, actually this was quite common that they hired picture snatchers to go run around and sneak around and steal photos um, out, of, out of people's private possessions. So he started as that. He also you know, says that he started writing a lot of what we call today fake news and getting it in the paper and then kind of uh, you know, got into a bit of trouble with that and straightened out a bit. But the, 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 that, that's the ethics of Chicago journalism of 1915 were not maybe the ethics of the New York Times or whatever in 2022. It was a pretty wild and woolly time. What Heck did um, night after night in this really roiling period of the, the, you know, the boom of the Industrial Revolution was cover crime. Um, and he spent a lot of time on death row with psychopaths that you know, had murdered people that were awaiting hanging. He covered something like 17 hangings um, as a newspaper reporter. And so he got a real window into psychopathy by talking to these people. And as a young man, kind of getting conned by them over and over where they would say in their final days on death row, no, I've changed, I found God or whatever else. And then something would happen where they would tip their hand and he'd realize that he'd been, he'd been sold a song and that these guys were cold-blooded killers, they were psychopaths. You know, a lot of them were very cunning and, and well able to put things, on, uh, put things over on the public. At the same time, he was seeing the burgeoning culture that would become the gunman and the, uh, the you know, the famous uh, scene of gangster land of Al Capone, Chicago, gangland of, of Al Capone, Chicago, when in 1919, you had the passage of the Volts, Volstead Act and prohibition. So, um, you had um, the, the, actually the newspapers got into a very bloody newspaper war where they were killing uh, newsboys. They were hiring thugs. Uh, their circulation departments were hiring thugs to beat up and, and often kill. Something like 23 newsboys were killed in this bloody newspaper war while Hecht was writing for papers. And a lot of these young thugs ended up by 1919, 1920 being the, 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 the gunmen of Al Capone, Chicago. Um, and you can, you can go back to the papers of 1913, 1915, you can find the names and then you can do a search and you can find them showing up in Al Capone's outfit and in rival outfits, same names, same people um, 10 years later. So the people that started, uh, that ended up in, 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 the, in the famous Chicago gangs of prohibition started under the employ of the newspapers, oddly enough. Uh, and at the same time, there was this mixing of the political culture and the gangster culture. So there was something every year called the gangster ball, where pimps and prostitutes and con men would lock arms with the police chief and the judges and march around in a circle in a big parade ground all together and party together at something that was called the gangster ball. And just to, to kind of, I know there's a lot of text, but it's worth hearing, so I'm going to read it out loud to you guys. The guest list included nearly every criminal in town with the price of a shave and nearly every whore from Englewood to Evanstown who had access to a ball gown. Pickpockets, pimps, porch climbers, jack rollers, sluggers, heisters, and gunmen I had seen before uh, court were on display socially in the Coliseum. 
and the judges with them. The judges, police officials, bigwigs from City Hall and State Capitol and every variety of the political genus were intermingled with the agents of crime and vice. And so what you saw was, in a sense, the parasite that had been feeding on you know, the, the downtown loop in Chicago that had been running a lot of the rackets and everything else ate the host by the time you had the passage of the Volstead Act and you had crime become a syndicated criminal enterprise. You had you know, what we call organized crime that launches with bootlegging and prohibition. And what Hecht sees is that is once Al Capone rises to power by the 1920s, he's got the, the politics, he's got the government of Chicago in his grip. So before the passage of the Volstead Act actually, or right while it's going on, the Chicago Daily News, which is Hecht's employer, which has got one of the greatest at this moment um, foreign correspondent outfits of any American newspaper, sends Hecht to Germany in 1919 in the immediate aftermath of World War I. And what he sees is a lot of the what he thought of as shenanigans and something that he, as a cynical young guy, he kind of laughed at, like the gangster's ball. It's kind of funny on some level. He saw it was not so funny in Germany in 1919. He saw the same kind of rackets, the same kind of subterfuge going on, only with criminals locking arms with the government and with people being machine gunned to death um, in places like Moabit Prison, um, where there was an uprising that was brutally put down um, you know, by, the, by the German government in this chaotic period. And so you know, what he says is, my cynicism when I got to Chicago in that kind of horrid I mean, when I got to Germany and that horrid oxygen of, of, of Germany, my cynicism lost his, its grin. And he saw a marriage of, of criminal activity and a kind of psychopathy that you see in thugs marrying with, with a political organization. He returns to Chicago for the, for the era of Al Capone. Um, and then this is, um, just to play you guys this briefly, um, while he, when he writes screenplays, this is a vivid example of Hecht expressing this worldview in Hollywood movies. So this movie is foreign correspondent. America is not yet in the war. Um, and what it's about is, you know, without being yet able to really name the Nazis as Nazis in a Hollywood movie, they're talking about a terrible uh, criminality spreading across Europe and the foreign course, the American correspondents over there not telling people the truth. This is a hex screenplay. And if you listen, I hope the sound turns out all right. You can hear what he says. I don't want any more economists, sages, or oracles bombinating over our cables. I want a reporter, somebody who doesn't know the difference between a nism and a kangaroo, a good, honest crime reporter. That's what the globe needs. That's what Europe needs. There's a crime hatching on that bedeviled continent. So that was the way he understood the war. That was the way he understood the rise of Nazism, was the rise of gangsters and psychopaths. Um, and um, you know, one of, one of his, his views about the public vis-a-vis -vis this, to give you the broader sense of how this roots directly in a view of the soul of man, is this line where he's talking about how the public was responding to in investigative reporting about the Capone regime. He says, you know, Big Bill Thompson was the mayor who was essentially the Chicago mayor who was uh, Capone's toady. And he says, every newspaper was a bloodhound bang after Thompson. The headlines never let up during Big Bill's long roost in City Hall. Scandal account, scandal was bared. The looting of the city's treasury was uh, constantly exposed and documented. Tales of thievery by Thompson and his henchmen of collusion between the city hall and the town's inferno of vice and crime were offered daily to the citizenry. In the teeth of this constant exposure as a political ogre, Thompson offered himself biannually as a candidate for mayor and was elected five times. Um, so you can see Heck's cynicism ran pretty deep. And then this leads to the second point, which is he nevertheless he sees the, final, the news of the final solution to the Jewish question. You know, there's an argument if you look at Nazi historiography that they themselves, as late as the late 1930s, did not have a specific program or policy for the Jews. They had not yet worked that out. The, poly, the, the policy of Nazi Germany 
up through the 40s was to make Europe Juden or Germany in particular Juden Rhein, which is rid of Jews. And so they tried to force out the Jews. And you so see you had this upside down situation where America and other allied countries were not accepting the Jews while the Nazis were trying to push them out. And then once you got into the war, particularly Holocaust historians um, root the, uh, the shift to the final solution of the Jewish question to the summer of 1941 and the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, when they really started marshalling their resources to setting up the train system, to saving bullets they were using on the Jews to, uh, to instead use poison gas and the crematorium. When all this comes out, heck shifts to say, we've got, we've got to wake the public up to this. We've got to rescue these people before it's too late. They're being wiped out on an industrial scale. But he's got that concern about what is, what is the soul of man? What are, are people really willing to stand up and push for this? It's going to take a collective yell or cry for help to make this happen if it can happen at all. So this is a moment, one of the few surviving film clips from We Will Never Die, his 1943 Holocaust pageant. And you can hear it uh, articulated, oops, right here. If I can get the, oops, uh, sorry. The Germans have promised to deliver to the world by the end of the year, a Christmas package of 4 million dead Jews. It is a problem that belongs to humanity. And it is a challenge to the soul of man. So, um, so to get a little bit on, on the next level of that, it's important to go back a little to say 1920, by the time Hecht is getting back from Germany, um, to realize he was not alone in having really questions of, of not just his experience in kind of industrial America, in urban America, as a crime reporter informing him, but, but for a lot of, for his generation, the Great War and what the Great War told them about uh, human nature. You know, the Enlightenment had been a belief in the goodness of people and the idea that, that fundamentally, if, if you had rationalism, if you had reason and you had progress, that this would lead to good things. And what they saw in the modern era with the birth of a modern secular world was machine guns and poison gas and trench warfare. And so they were all staggering out of this and questioning, raising fundamental questions about the nature of man. And so just to put Hecht in line with two of his other peers at the time, to, to understand specifically what Hecht was saying about the nature of man, you had Walter Lippmann, who by 1920 was saying, you know, it emerged out of the experience of the war and was saying, the world is too complicated for the average American voter, the average person who's supposed to self-govern to handle, um, you know, people are not omnicompetent. They, if you ask them about a complicated question like, I don't know, vaccines, the science of vaccines or climate change or healthcare policy, that this is too much, that the average person is, is too busy and too harried for the sort of complicated questions that run the world. We need experts, we need a, a class of experts that can legislate or inform government to run this, okay? So his view was that, that there were limitations to the average person, right? That we just had to be realistic about, it, especially in an age of mass media. Um, then you had H.L. Mencken, who is a, a, a mentor for Heck. Heck's, I mean, Mencken's view was a little more blunt. He thought people were stupid. He like basically uh, used the word um, boobs for American people. And instead of the bourgeoisie, he called kind of the American public, the, the, the Midwesterners and the kind of the people of flyover country as we call it now, he called them the bourgeoisie. Hecht had really a darker view than either Lippmann or Mink. In Hecht's view, what he began to emerge with, and again, I think this was his experience with criminality, psychopathy, all that kind of thing, was that there were some really, really dark currents in human nature. And, and some of the most significant ones that we saw to, to come into light not just the, the kind of predatory ones that we see with, with you know, the full-blown psychopath, the killer, but just the, the more pervasive ones that are part of this dark motivation are our tribalism, our fear of outsiders, our prejudice, our bigotry. And he began to believe 
that the right kind of demagogue could emerge and push buttons in people and, and you know, unleash this, this really dark side of human nature. And there were a lot of people with the rise of Nazism. The one, one of the most important things I learned from writing this book is that for people who lived through this era, the, you know, intellectuals, people who were talking about this and trying to figure out this together, they looked at the rise of Nazism and they said, what explains this? What is this? Explaining it in terms of politics didn't make any sense. You can't explain this, you can't explain Nazism in terms of a debate over tax policy or an argument about how large or small government should be or you know, any of those states' rights versus federal rights. People understood it as, as, a, a, as madness. And they, and they said, we have to start looking at politics at root as a, as a question of human psychology. And so I think what Hecht read in The Rise of Nazism is, you know, we're used to talking about psychology as an individual uh, condition. What a lot of intellectuals of the uh, 1930s and 40s began to write about and think about was the idea of mass psychology or political psychology. And what the way Hecht understood the rise of Nazism was the rise of mass psychopathy. So to use kind of an analogy for what he was reading in what happened with Hitler, if you think about a tuning fork, right? Um, well, to back up for a second, just to give you an idea of like, when we talk about autism, we talk about a spectrum, right? Uh, people being on the spectrum or whatever. What he was essentially saying was that when it comes to a, a, something like, like psychopaths, like people who have a lack of empathy, who are cunning, um, who are, you know, don't regret the, the wrong things they do. That's in all of us. But there's a certain population, there's a certain amount of the human population that leans on the side towards the psychopath. The people on the extremes are full-blown psychopaths, but a lot of us are somewhere on that spectrum. And so to, to shift to an, another analogy from the, the, the spectrum for a second, if you think about the idea of the tuning fork, right? If you, if you bang a large tuning fork and you have other small tuning forks, the small tuning forks will begin to vibrate in sympathy with the big tuning fork. And what he saw was with a figure like Hitler was someone who learned how to tune in on that vibration, how to tap into that element that was in any population, any group of, of, of millions of people. There was something like 40 million Germans at the time. And so he learned how to condition them so that every time he banged on the tuning fork, they began to vibrate in, in sympathy with certain messages that he, he kind of conditioned them to be ready for. Um, so it, it was like they, he gave them their dopamine hit um, and that was how they responded. Um, so, and, and, and you know, the fundamental thing is this raises uh, questions about, um, you know, fundamental questions about how well can our democracy really function if there are pro these problems with democracy. So, you know, when I put this slide together, we were not in such an elemental fight about the soul of America, right? We are now. And so none of this, this may all seem like yesterday's news, but when I was writing this book in 2012, 2013, I thought, you know, these are a lot of debates that we have been putting off having about our own system and how well it works um, that really get at the, the root of a lot of the longstanding arguments we have. And what we've seen by 2022 is all of this stuff has really reared its head. And we're fighting over these, we're having these arguments over now about what kind of people are we? And what are the implications in terms of the way we structure and order our society? Um, so this is again, this idea of using, you know, this gets into propaganda and disinformation, the idea of the big lie, can you tell, which is now, when I made this slide, this wasn't part of our regular political dialogue. This has now been introduced. We now are talking about the big lie again, but the big lie going back to the 30s and 40s, which is where it was born out of, it actually really begins to circulate during the era of McCarthy in the early 50s, is um, the idea of telling some big, simple tale and telling it over and over again, never mind the facts, because if, if, if you can sell people on the story, then they'll believe whatever facts or evidence you give them. Um, <clears throat> 
And then a final part of this, and this is where I'm gonna wrap up and, and get questions, I know I'm probably over, um, is the idea you can't study the Holocaust without studying man's capacity or human's capacity for denial and denialism. So something that I think is really important if you talk to any Holocaust scholar and that I hope that as, as a community, we make a bigger a community of scholars, we make a bigger deal about is this idea of natural, um, the natural proclivity that we have to denialism. And in the 1930s and 1940s, that meant the spread of Hitler across Europe. That's why you had appeasement um, and no check on Hitler when he, um, you know, first uh, when he went into Austria, when he first, you know, took a chunk of France, then went into Austria, then, um, you know, most famously Czechoslovakia. And, and then of course you have it with the rise of the Holocaust itself. What Deborah Lipstadt said was beyond belief. So a lot of what this story is about is man's capacity for denial. And if you think about the things that we confront now in a post-World War II atomic age, when we really face on all these different fronts, fronts and increasingly questions, existential questions, whether it's you know, fighting with the spread of a pandemic and how we deal with that or climate change or questions of whether our democracy will survive, so I'm gonna play you guys one more clip and then if we have time, Karina, you'll have to tell us, but I'll take questions. I'm sorry I went over, but uh, you know, I never really know exactly how long it's gonna take. All right, so here's a clip from another great journalist, Edward R. Murrow, uh, that I just kind of love. And so I kind of had to share it with you guys about man's, capa American's capacity for denial. And I'm gonna leave, conclude with that for my talk, so. This might just do nobody any good. At the end of this discourse, a few people may accuse this reporter of fouling his own comfortable nest, and your organization may be accused of having given hospitality to heretical and even dangerous ideas. But the elaborate structure of networks, advertising agencies, and sponsors will not be shaken or altered. It is my desire, if not my duty, to try to talk to you journeymen with some candor about what is happening to radio and television. And if what I say is responsible, I alone am responsible for the saying of it. Our history will be what we make of it. And if there are any historians about 50 or 100 years from now, and there should be preserved the kinescopes of one week of all three networks, they will there find, recorded in black and white and in color, evidence of decadence, escapism, and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable, and complacent. We have a built-in allergy to unpleasant or disturbing information. Our mass media reflect this. But unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it may see a totally different picture too late. So on that cheery note, <laughs> um, let me, and then of course, you guys all disappear. I have to bring you back somehow. You disappeared behind some screen of mine. Uh, there you are. Um, you know, should I take questions at this point, Karina? Or how do Yes. We... So thank you very much for that presentation. You're going to want to stop sharing your screen. And then Alfie is going to facilitate a Q&A. We did receive several questions. Thank you for everybody that submitted questions. Um, check the chat if you haven't already. There's a link to the exit survey if you need to hell on and leave. If you want to stay um, for the remainder of this Q&A portion, you are definitely welcome to do so. And if you want to submit a question now, um, you can still send those in to Alfie or myself. And if you would like to unmute yourself, um, just ping me or Alfie, and we will give you that option to verbally present your question. So Alfie. Yeah, and, and thank you again, Dr. Gorbach. Uh, that was really fascinating, and uh, especially that last clip and considering how he was talking about TV, and yet now we're, we're in an internet information age, uh, where the problem is probably just magnified even further. Um, okay, so the 
Uh, one of the questions we received from our audience um, was from Tony Sloan. Uh, what was Heck's main inspiration for wanting to become a writer? Um, what piqued his in interest initially? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, I think in part he got it from his dad who would sit around with the family and tell tales. Um, I, think, I think he, you know, I mean, this is almost gonna sound um, belittling in a way, but I think Heck loved boy adventure stories. Um, I think he loved stories about pirates um, and circus uh, people. He actually was in a traveling circus in high school. He did trapeze performances and everything. Um, you know, it's it's funny because um, he wrote a lot of of popular fiction, and um, it's the stuff of like boyhood and childhood. And so I, I I think that it it kind of from a real love of life. I mean, I, I, I think it's not, and a love of, of, I think he fell in love. It was almost like an, ero, an erotic, you know, I mean, he fell so passionately in love with words um, as did his, his peers. I mean, he was part of the Chicago Renaissance, which was one of the most important American little, literary movements of history. It's what introduced um, the American public to basically every, what's what's on el every syllabus of like every English class you'll find. I mean, th this small group of this handful of writers through a very small magazine introduced the world to, you know, a lot of the writers were their peers, but Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, um, the first short stories of, of, um, of Ernest Hemingway. I mean, the, the list of people that, that, that were brought to the American public through the Chicago Renaissance. The list of writers is just astonishing. So on the one hand, you've got his kind of his boyhood and his sort of childlike fascination with stories and language. And then you also have as a young man, um, the kind of the real burst of modernism and this avant-garde and love for the arts. It wasn't just a love for literature, it was also a love for the, the arts, you know, visual arts, sculpture and everything else, they were all kind of together and they, and they did heck less so, but his peers really embraced a lot of socialism and political radicalism. Heck at the time was a cynic and, and distanced himself. And so it's in many ways ironic that he, he got engaged in politics at this much later time in his life. I don't know if that answers your question. This is about as best as I can do off the cuff. Uh, thank you. Um, this question is from Joseph. In, in spite of the Exodus story of hope, centuries of persecution, the Shoah story of finality, and the creation of the state of Israel, why does the Jewish question persist? Um, are humanism or militancy sufficient for human progress? Uh, and who asked that? Joseph? Joseph what? Yeah, uh, I didn't get a last name. Okay. Joseph Trinesky. I am so glad, Joseph, that you asked that because that is a question that you will hear so many um, Holocaust historians, well, not, not necessarily Holocaust historians, but Jewish historians uh, refuse to answer. They, they will tell you it's an offensive question. And that seems to be a modern phenomenon that we can't talk about why anti-Semitism comes up that we can't offer explanations to it. But, but many people who get asked that, many scholars who get asked that respond by saying it is, it is based in unreason, it is hate, and to try and offer explanations for it is offensive. The conversation about it is offensive. I do not think, first of all, I, I do not think that's a, a, an insightful, I mean, I don't know. I don't just know how helpful that is be, and, and second of all, if you've read a number of really important Jewish historians, you, you know that, you know, that a lot of them have, have addressed this quite a lot, like people like Walter LaCour or um, I'm trying to, you know, I always blank on the name when I'm put on a spot, but uh, the guy who talked about redemptive anti-Semitism, one of the greatest uh, Holocaust historians, talk about this in depth. And, and the quick answer is, um, you, there is a way to kind of understand um, the, the historical explanation for this. And it's that with the birth of the enlightenment, you had, I mean, one thing to understand about European history as an American 
is that the emancipation, what they called emancipation of the Jews in Central Europe or in parts of Europe that happened in the mid 19th century is as important to European history as the Emancipation Proclamation is to American history. And what had happened was you had the Enlightenment, which introduced these idea of reason and tolerance and equal rights and rights of man. And this evolution where you started having constitutional democracies and this freeing up, this kind of move away from the feudalistic, you know, uh, monarchistic system, autocratic system of, of the feudal era into a modern secular Europe. Part of that meant giving Jews who, who for centuries in Europe had been in, in shtetls or in ghettos, giving them equal rights. Emancipation was the term that happened in country after country for allowing Jews to join the broader uh, Christian society. And what happened with that was then you had the emergence of Jewish doctors, Jewish you know, um, politicians, um, Jewish professors, all aspects of Jews joining European life and that, and that famous term assimilation. What it began to happen by the 19th century is you nevertheless had recurring incidences of, of riots and killings of Jews, just like there had been before the enlightenment. And so what you had with the emergence of Zionism was leaders like Theodore Her uh, um, Herzl or Leon Pinsker asking, um, why is this happening? Why in a secular era with the enlightenment is this continuing to happen? And this guy Leon Pinsker offered a theory which was that ever since the diaspora, ever since that the Romans and the, and the exodus of Jews from, from Palestine, Jews had been guests in other people's houses. And so as long as they were strangers in a strange land or the, the element of whatever um, in Europe, say, they were in their separate community, they were not assimilated, people could always be, point to them and say, oh, it's a, it's a downturn, it's a famine, it's an it's a economic depression, it's your fault, it's their fault. So they, could, they were always a convenient scapegoat because they were an outsider community in Europe for so many centuries and a significant outsider community. What happened post-Enlightenment was that with the changes in the modern world, say I was talking about people looking at World War I as Europeans and saying, what the hell happened? This is the fruits of the modern world. This is the modern world. Well, who do you blame for that? You blame this new face of modernity that has emerged, that has just joined the crowd. And you say, you see these guys who have slipped in here, who think they're, they're part of us now? They're the real secret cause to all the problems. And if you look at Hitler's, you know, uh, like rap to the German people, the big lie that he told about, about the Jews to explain the depression and explain the, the, the straits that Germany was in, what he could say is, here's the face of modern Europe. Here's the face of liberalism. You want liberal, you want modernity, this is what you get. You get these people with the hook nose and the, and the puppet masters of Churchill and Stalin and everything else. And by the way, I, the, the, the name I was forgetting, so Walter LaCour is, you know, and I could put it in the chat, these authors who, who are the ones who articulate this, Walter LaCour who, who writes a masterful history of Zionism and Saul Friedlander was the guy who is the, the uh, one who, who brought up that term redemptive anti-Semitism as a term to explain how Hitler used the idea of a, a ultimately what was a military war against the Jews as a way to kind of say what we're really in it. We're not really in a fight against Stalin. We're not really in a fight against Churchill or Roosevelt. These are all just the puppets to the puppet master of the Jews. And what we really have to do is strike over their heads at the enemy, which is the Jews to get them. And, and Saul Friedlander, his term for this was redemptive anti-Semitism. Why does all this matter now? Well, I mean, if you look at any modern 20th century society, say a society where you have a minority majority, right? Where you have a majority of the country suddenly becoming a, all the minorities and people don't like that. And you wanna point at everything that's wrong with the modern world. You say, you see these people streaming across the border? <laughs> 
This is liberalism. This is the problem with the way things are changing. And if we don't fight back against it, these people are going to destroy us. It's a war that we're in and it's a war for survival. And so it's not just, this is not just a story about how anti-Semitism has survived. It's about how hate survives. Um, and it's called redemptive anti-Semitism. Oops. Uh, next question. Do we are we? I don't sure. know. Maybe maybe we have time for one more. Um, sure. And and this is kind of a nice segue from from where you were landing. Uh, this is from Lauren. Uh, what what do you think Ben Hecht would say or think about the rise of Trumpism? I mean, you know, there there are a lot of people who um, who I think are on the right. Um, you know, conservatives who see Heck's tough Jew thing, his, his militarism, um, they think he was anti-Arab or anti-Muslim, which, I mean, you have to understand the politics of the 30s and 40s. The, for an American Jew like Heck who lived through the Holocaust, the Arab-Israeli fight hadn't come into focus during this period of his activism. And because of the, 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 the terribly bitter war, which ended in bloodshed between the two Jewish factions, Hecht washed his hands in 1948 of Jewish politics. So people who wanna, on the right, who wanna embrace Hecht in the 21st century, it's just more complicated than that. You can't graph the politics of the 1940s directly onto the politics of, the, of 2022 and say, Hecht was a right winger or something, which he wasn't in the 40s. You know, he was a liberal who had his own perspective on things. But you can't say he was on the right then, he'd be on the right now. I th you know, my personal view, I think Hecht uh, was, you know, had, a, had, a, had his antenna up for demagogues. I think he understood them. I think he understood appeals to hate, uh, a lot of times ahead of other people. And... You know, whether you want to talk about Hecht in terms of a, a partisan, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily partisan because there are plenty of Republicans who are deeply, deeply suspicious of, of um, Trump because they feel he's anti-democratic or whatever. But whether you want to, you know, you want to take the partisanship out of it or not, I, I think, you know, you look at you look at Jewish American writers like Philip Roth or Saul Bellow. I think it's really important to take a second look at Ben Hecht not just his films, but also his prose, because his themes in his writing are so important to us today for, for all the, the reasons that I'm talking about today. So, you know, you can draw your own conclusions about Trump. It's just difficult for me as, and, and okay, I'm a liberal, it's difficult for me to read Hecht, read his warnings about the rights of man and the soul of man and our, our dark implications and, and not see him as like, would have would have been one of the most vocal anti-Trumpers. Now, I also think he would have been, I think, I think, you know, my my dissertation about this was called Crying in the Wilderness. And the reason it was called that is because there's this is a line about the Jewish prophets, which is that when they went and spoke out, they 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 focused their ire not on the Babylonians or the Philistines, but on the chosen people who should know better. And Hecht really directed his criticism and his guns on Roosevelt and the liberals. And I think he did it because I think he saw himself as an iconoclast whose job was to, so I think he would have been relentless against the Democratic Party. And I think he would have been really tough on people like Biden and others for not being tougher in standing up against Trump and not being more forthright. I mean, like the decision of the Democratic Party to not have a fight over democracy, to say, well, it's gonna be about kitchen. I, I, I don't know. It's a question I have, you know, would that have infuriated Hecht and said, you need to take these people on and, 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 and fight over what's right and wrong here and not try to politic your way around it. He was just very blunt, you know? Um, so are we, are we out of time? Boy, these questions were fun.